and uh, that uh, certainly is a blessing. And uh, Gordon got home as well. Uh, as most of you know, his surgery, his surgery went well, and appears to be recovering. So we're we're glad that both of them are home and recovering and, and uh, getting along. I do want to just kind of jump or dive right into today's message. Uh, today's message is one of those that kind of started out with, I wonder where you're going to take it, Lord, and then as God typically does and does immeasurably more, uh, I think I have more messages than time. So we're going to try to squeeze everything in the Lord wants to uh, share this morning. Today's title is a question. Is Jesus visible in me? This question could also be asked in the idea of, is my light shining? <laughs> of course, as an adult, when I, when I thought of that, as adults, we tend to not want to either ask ourselves questions like this or especially ask ourselves the, the question, is my light shining? Because just like the kid songs that we just heard and the idea from them, we remember the songs of youth that talk about our light and, and this little light of mine. Uh, and, and we think we've outgrown those type of notions. Does anybody kind of get along that idea with me? We know the world is telling us that those are childish notions. But we also know and understand that Scripture tells us is that we need to be like children. Uninhibited and, and free to exclaim and to proclaim, Jesus' light is in me. And to recognize that we have the light of Jesus within us. And that, that light is supposed to be shining. It is supposed to be evident for people to see. Of course, one of the references to our light shining uh, that most of us are familiar with are found in Jesus' teaching uh, and telling us that we are the salt and the light of the world. And we're going to look at this scripture for a few moments. So if you would open your Bibles. Uh, to Matthew chapter 5, we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 16. Uh, while you're turning in your Bibles, I will share with you that I am still struggling with a cough at times, and I can kind of feel one coming on, but I'm going to do my best and trust the Lord's enabling to, uh, to be able to proclaim His Word without too much interruption. Also, I want to just kind of take this moment and to see how are you doing in reading the book of John? Uh, for those that were not here last week and you might have saw the, in the message or watched the message on YouTube or, or received the email, I challenged everyone uh, for Lent this year um, basically to give up a little time and to give as a sacrificial offering to God um, to read one chapter of the book of John every day. Um, doing so and then the time frame you are going to be able to read the book of John twice through, and I think it's important for us to read uh, John all the way through twice. Uh, I think that, that it will enlighten us. So there's still plenty of time to get started on that, and I would encourage you uh, to be faithful in that and read one chapter of the book of John uh, each day through uh, Easter. Again, we're looking at Matthew chapter 5 this morning, uh, verses 13 through 16. We're going to go through the first verses fairly quickly. Uh, Jesus is speaking to us here, and he says, you are the salt of the earth. That's a proclamation. That's a statement of truth. It's not a question. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown away and trampled underfoot. Uh, quickly, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. If salt loses its saltiness, it does not refer to losing your salvation. It's just you kind of, as Christians, and we can all attest to the fact that times we bury our head in the sand. It's the idea that we stop being the salt. We, we stop uh, being something that others desire. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, uh, we know that, that Jesus is telling us we are the salt, or we are something as a follower of his. Uh, that should season other people's life. Moving on to verse 14. Again, he says, you are, statement of truth, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. I want you to remember those three words cannot be hidden because the emphasis of today's message is on these words that it cannot be hidden. Moving on to verse 15. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. 
See, neither do people, and of course this is referring to God's people, Jesus is talking to his disciples, his followers, neither do people who want to be the light of the world, they don't want their lamp to be hidden. We don't hide our lamp, we don't put it under a bowl, we don't hide it from people, we put it on its stand, or it's the idea is we make ourselves ready. We do what we're supposed to be doing so that our light is visible, so that it gives light, so that it does what God would have to do, what we would want our light to do, that we would be able to have people see Jesus within us. That's the light that we're wanting to be seen, so that everyone in the house is able to see it. And moving on again into verse 16, in the same way, see Jesus has given us kind of a parable, something to, uh, to use as an analogy, and he says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Of course, this uh, closely uh, relates to our verse for the year from uh, Colossians 3.17, that whatever we do in word and deed would be honoring to God, that is, that we do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so it is this idea, is continually being carried that whatever we do, we're doing it in God's name, we're doing it in the name of Christ so that it is glorifying to the Father in heaven. And just to be clear, there's some foundational work that we need to set here, just so that it's clear in our mind that Jesus is the light that we're referring to. And that our, our calling as disciples, as followers of Jesus, that we have a calling to let our light shine. Uh, we're going to look at John chapter 8, verse 12. Again, Jesus is talking to us, and he very plainly tells us, I am the light of the world. And he's speaking of himself. He's making this proclamation for us. I am the light of the world. And he goes on to say, he says, Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. These are encouraging words because it's telling us who Jesus is. He is the light. And so that's the encouragement. We know that he is the one, uh, that, that the light that is filling us and that we're to be following and he says, whoever follows me, anyone, everyone is welcome. And those that follow will never walk in the darkness of the world. What this is referring to is we will never have to succumb to the enemy, the darkness of the world. We do not have to succumb to the evils of the world because we follow the light of the world. And he goes on to tell us that those who follow him will have. Again, I always am encouraged when Jesus tells us and through his word makes statements of fact. He doesn't say that if you do certain things, you will have my light in you. He says all you have to do is have the desire to follow me. Has anybody here have a desire to follow Jesus today? Amen. Amen? Okay, that means you have the light of Jesus within you. There's no other requirement. There's no other thing you have to do but to have that desire. Because see, once we have the desire, everything else will fall into place. When we have the desire to follow Jesus and his promise that we will have his light and not walk in darkness, then we will reflect Jesus. And that's our goal. Very simple. Amen. We all do it every day. Perfectly, right? So the question of the title, is Jesus visible in me? <coughs> Sometimes? Always? At church, but not so much at work? Maybe the thought has popped into your mind with this is, do I really want Jesus' light to shine in me? I think it's about a question. Because it's recognizing that you have the light and that it's shining and you have to decide, do I want this? And I think you have to ask the question so that your inner heart can tell you, yes, this is a desire of mine. I want Jesus to be visible in me. Does anybody not want that? It can get a little scary, but our inner desire is that we do have the light of Christ within us. <coughs> Maybe some of us have never realized before that the light of Jesus within us is a done deal. 
See, because we didn't realize that, that Jesus was saying you have it and that you are the light of the world because you have me in you. And so we didn't realize that this was a statement of truth and fact. And so we didn't realize that we had a light that was shining that we were oblivious to. We didn't realize, perhaps, that his light cannot be hidden. Isn't that a change of thought? Jesus' light cannot be hidden. You see, in the whatevers of life, as we're learning that whatever we do, we do in the name of Jesus, in all these whatevers, we're asking ourselves, and really have been asking ourselves, is my light shining? Is, is Jesus visible in me? Is his light in me a blinding light? Does anybody want to have a blinding light? Be so full of Jesus that it just knocks everybody down? Is Jesus' light within you a warm glove? Or is it strong and, and steady? Is it soft and welcoming? Comforting? Maybe sometimes dead. Thank you. I have a few examples that the Lord led me to show as an example in Acts chapter 13, verse 47. Paul and Barnabas are in the synagogue and they're, they're being questioned about their faith. In fact, they're being ridiculed. It's at this point that, that uh, the, the Jewish leaders and all are you know, basically demanding them to change what they're proclaiming to be true. And, and they stand up and they boldly tell the people, again, verse 47 of Acts 13, they say, for this is what the Lord has commanded of us. They're basically saying we have no choice but to allow our light to shine because we're followers of Jesus. His light is within us. It cannot be hidden. And he commanded of us. And then basically told us, going on in this verse, he says, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. See, this is the purpose of the light within us, that we reflect Christ so that we draw others to Christ. So that they have the same light, the same understanding that we have. And in this verse when it says that, that you and Jesus instructing us, commanding us that you may bring salvation, the may is granting us authority. We need to say that you may do this. This is yes, you may. This isn't asking can I do this. It's being told that we have been given the authority so that you may do this. Every one of us have been given the authority that we may bring salvation to the end of the earth. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Amen. Yeah, thank you. And also the you here that we need to look at this when he says, I have made you a light for a Gentile is both singular and plural. It's for each one of us individually and it's for all followers. It's for everyone who follows Jesus. It's that each one of us are meant to be disciples, just as Paul and Barnabas were, and that we are disciples of Christ. Going on in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5 teaches about godly living. It teaches us how to live as Christians. It's another instructional uh, book. And in Ephesians 5, verse 8, we're very plainly told that once, for once, we were in darkness. But now you are the light of the world. Live as children of light. And this living as children of Jesus' light is the idea that we understand that as children of God, Jesus' light is visible within us. Again, we're wanting to make sure we have firmly in our mind this understanding that the light of Jesus cannot be hidden. It cannot be hidden. <laughs> I want to share three examples of Jesus' light being visible in people and the truth that it cannot be hidden. I suppose it's not necessarily always seen, but Jesus' light cannot be hidden. 
not only are the examples I'm going to give evidence of Jesus being visible, but the people themselves that I'm going to share with you did not have to work at being children of life. And I want you to understand that and understand the emphasis I'm putting on this. <clears throat> the examples I'm going to share with you were natural responses of people simply because they are followers of Jesus. And in some cases, they may not even recognize or call themselves followers of Jesus. But again, Jesus' light cannot be hidden. Just to, again, to bear this and prove this out in John chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, it says, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. This is in reference to Jesus and telling us Jesus is coming into the world, has come into the world, and that his light is for everyone. And in verse 10, it says, he was, uh, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Again, we understand that the light cannot be hidden, but it doesn't mean that necessarily everybody recognizes it. As I've said, Gabriella got home on Friday. And all through the last several months, Jesus' light and love has been visible in a multitude of people. It humbles me to think about and to share with you the hundreds and hundreds of people that have expressed that they are praying and have been praying for Gabrielle and our family. It is simply amazing to realize that that many people would respond to where we know about. And so then when you take into account the number that we are unaware of, that have heard and are praying and have been praying for a little girl that is going through brain surgery and a family and everything that has been going on, There's no way that you cannot see Jesus and his light shining in all these people. I mean, this is the plural form in its greatest essence of showing that God's light shines and cannot be hidden. Young and old alike, alike excuse me, have allowed the light of Jesus to shine in them. And again, none of them worked at having to do so. The love, the compassion, the sympathy of Jesus naturally poured forth from them. To try to tell you even a fraction of the events that we've seen would take all day. It is simply a, an example of Jesus' life not being able to be hidden and visible to people. The second example I want to share with you is of a new friend I made when I was in the hospital. Kelly was the nurse in the emergency room that was taking care of me. I'm sure that Kelly didn't do anything differently for me than she did for all of us. And I don't think she realizes how much the light of Jesus shines in her. She had a sense of peace and confidence about her that was noticeable. And since becoming friends and having some conversations with her, I know that her life is just as chaotic as all of ours. Both private and professional life of a nurse is challenging. Yet the presence of Jesus readily being visible within her was such a strong encouragement to me. And again, I can't overemphasize the idea that she wasn't working at being the light of Christ. She wasn't consciously trying to put the effort into being a good example of Jesus. Now, I'm not saying we should never put an effort into it, because we should. 
We need to make the decision we want to follow Christ or we want to be good examples. But what happens when we make that decision, when that's a desire of our heart, is that it comes naturally. We naturally begin to be examples of Jesus. Because this love is within us, this light is within us, and it is evident for people. Are we beginning to understand that the natural quality of Jesus being expressed in our words and our deeds as his followers is something that we can depend on? The third example happened this past Thursday. I had a first pre-marriage counseling meeting with a nephew of mine that I'm not actually related to. I think you understand that. He's the son of a friend of mine that we've been friends forever and is like a brother to me. I had spent lots of time with Aaron when he was growing up. Uh, from the time of him being a, a newborn uh, to his high school years, I have to admit through those years I was not a very good example for Aaron. Since the years and year following that, that Christ has made a new creation out of me and my life has changed, I haven't really been in contact with Aaron a whole lot. I've seen him here and there. I have met his fiancée, Morgan, a few times, but I don't remember that we ever had any in-depth conversations. <coughs> I tell you this because when Aaron called me and asked me to perform their wedding ceremony, I was honored and delighted to be able to do it but I have to say I was also surprised that he had called me. And, and I assumed that I was being asked to perform the wedding, the marriage ceremony, more out of convenience than any other. I mean, they needed somebody to marry them. I can do that. We know each other. So they asked me, to be the, the one to do so. We had arranged to meet this past Thursday at 4.30 in the evening, and I have to say that my preconceived notions were blown out of the water that night. I'd like to be able to tell you and to say, oh, well, I didn't prejudge that man before Thursday evening, but I did. You see, I assumed that a couple that has been together for six years on their wedding day, on August the 17th, they're getting married, will be exactly six years. That's kind of me. I had assumed that a couple that have been together for six years lived their lives in certain worldly fashions. I assumed that they didn't go to church regularly and that Pre-marriage counseling was something they viewed as had to do and not desired to do. As I said, my, my preconceived notions have changed. What I, <coughs> excuse me, what I found on Thursday was a couple who deeply loved God first Amen. and passionately loved each other. Which is the only way you really can. I was refreshed and excited by their examples of multiple devotions that they read each day, both by themselves and as a couple. I was excited to hear that they start every day in prayer and end it the same way. And then, as Morgan said, and then we just pray all day long. The reason for waiting so long to get married was not thumbing their nose at godly traditions, but it was out of a desire to honor God and 
maturing to a place where they can stand firm in their faith and all that holy matrimony stands for. I didn't expect to hear the words holy matrimony brought out by him. Fully understanding what it means to be holy married and in God. They understand that God is a part of their vows. They, they want traditional vows that honor God as part of their ceremony. I'm excited for our next meeting, and I can assure you that I am going to be better prepared to apply God's word to living as husband and wife when we meet. You see, the Lord <coughs> gave me some chastisement over my preconceived notions and ideas. He gave me this thought. Light bearers can be blinded by their light and miss the pure light of others. That didn't look good I like didn't hear. You see, Jesus' light cannot be hidden, but it can be ignored. I'm humbled by their light. And I pray that the chastising that the Lord has given me will allow me to see the light of Jesus in others to a greater degree. As I said, the light of Jesus cannot be hidden, but we can ignore it. And too often, that is the case. Too often, we overlook the love and compassion that is pouring out of someone, maybe being skeptical of their motive. Maybe, maybe just in this world of busyness and preoccupation and and preconceived notions, we've already formed our own opinion before anything is, is even evident before us. I, I gotta keep coming back to the title of today's message and the question Is Jesus visible in me? And I have to tell myself, Scripture has proved to me that it is. I have his light. The light of Jesus is within me. I've been given the promise. I've been given the truth. I've stated it. I've read it. I've understood it. Jesus' light is in me. But can you see? See, there's the difference between brain knowledge and heart knowledge. Our brain right now is having to accept the truth that Jesus is within us, his light is within us, and it will be visible. It cannot be hidden. But do we want our light to shine? This little light of mine. I don't want it to shine. Amen. Amen. So is Jesus' light visible in me? Is Jesus' light visible in you? <coughs> sure it is. Sure it is. We just need to decide how brightly we want to find. As we turn our thoughts to communion this morning, I hope that each one of us is refreshed. I hope each one of us is encouraged by the knowledge that Jesus has promised us and also commanded us that we are to be a light to all people. <coughs> Jesus told us in reference to communion to do this in remembrance of him. We've talked about this so many times. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. I think especially today when, when we're looking out, going out into the world and leaving this building and the rest of the day and the rest of the week and the rest of the forever and all the whatevers we're going to be doing, we may wonder or hesitate or 
be skeptical of this idea of our light shining and Jesus being visible within us. But then we need to have in our minds, do it in remembrance of me. Because of what Jesus did, we have his light. It isn't about our strength, our power, our ability. It is about Jesus being there. So make it your prayer today. Make it an excitement. Make it part of, of the Lenten season and the idea that Easter is coming and the change in our lives that it represents. I want my light to shine. And I want it to shine naturally. I want Jesus to flow out of me and for others to be encouraged by it. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray this morning. Father, as we come to you, we just humbly bow before you. Our hearts bend to me and we confess before you that though the light of Jesus cannot be hidden, we have tried to hide it. Though the light of Jesus is within us, we have covered it with a bowl. Lord, help us to desire deep within our heart and to acknowledge that desire in our mind that we want to set the light of Jesus on the stand, recognizing that we are the stand, that the light burns. Father, give us desires that whatever we do, that whatever we speak, whatever we think, whatever actions we take, we would do that in Jesus' name, in remembrance of him and the enabling we have because he died upon the cross for our sins, that he reconciled us to you. Father, we are so thankful that not only can we be chastised, but we can be encouraged, that we can be shown how we've neglected but also be encouraged of how we can move forward and shine brightly. Father, this is a simple message, but these are difficult times and we need simple truths. Help us to understand that your love is for all people, that you want everyone to see and experience the light of your son Jesus. Help us to be witnesses. Help us to be examples. Help us to love as we are loved. Father, we thank you, we praise you, we lift our prayers to you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.